Welcome, everybody. Welcome virtually. Welcome physically. I never know what direction to look, so I'm just going to wave my head around in random directions. Um, this is week three, four, week something or other of the History of Material Text Workshop. Four, according to my co-organizer, Jerry Singerman, who sits a few shell seats down, and our other co-organizer, Zach Lesser, a few seats away. Um, so welcome newcomers and welcome back regulars. Um, on the logistics side, Island will as ever pass around a sign up sheet for those in the room and we always appreciate you signing up. We always appreciate though, whether you are virtual or in person referring um, new visitors, new students, new friends to the seminar. Um, our topics change weekly and we love to encourage the continuity of discussion that um, can really happen when overlapping interests from across time and space come together. So um, I, I suspect we're going to have some of that here tonight. Um, a couple of very quick announcements. Um, first, an event in the Kislak Center. Some of you may have seen this in your email. Tomorrow afternoon, starting at 2 p.m. and going till 6 p.m., we will have a kind of open house showcase. We have never done this before. Um, we have continued to acquire some amazing materials of global scope uh, while you were away um, in virtual world. So we've entitled it that the event that, and we are essentially going to set out a rather large selection of these materials in the pavilion here in this room tomorrow afternoon. So Nick and Lynn have organized a um, a feast of, of spectacular items. Um, everybody's welcome, no sign up necessary. Come browse, tell your students, come wander <laughs> around for as much time as you have, especially if you're in the library and we'd love to see you. That's tomorrow, Tuesday, two to six. My next announcement is about next week before we turn to the main event tonight. Next week, um, Teresa Gadu from Vanderbilt will be speaking on anti-slavery media. However, we have a slight change of plans um, owing to things pandemic. Teresa is not able to travel here in person and will be delivering her talk remotely on Zoom. For you Zoom regulars, there's of course no change, um, but I did wanna let folks know that if you wish to attend in this room, some of us will be here and we will put the project the event up on the screen. Um, so you are welcome to join um, to join some of us here. Uh, usual bad time, bad channel to hear Teresa via Zoom. So that's next week. Uh, any other announcements from anybody? Okay, um, great. So on to tonight. It's really a pleasure for me to be able to welcome Marge Bruchak this evening to Material Texts. Um, I should say that our invitation is really long overdue because Marge's multiple projects on Wampum, as you will hear, really center on a creation that is in both its materiality and its textuality raise powerful and important questions about those categories. So that is exactly what this seminar tries to foreground. Um, so this is perfect. Dr. Mark Bruchak, um, who's Abnaki and part of the extraordinary Bruchak family, wears so many hats, I think that I will not be able to summarize all of them here. She's Associate Professor of Anthropology at Penn. She's a historical consultant to many organizations throughout the Northeast. She's a storyteller and performer. She's an organizer including Penn's Native American and Indigenous Studies program here. She's an activist for Native communities and a voice for Native artifacts. And I would like to recommend her extended discussion in the proceedings of the APS of two Haudenosaunee wampum belts that were offered for sale at Sotheby's, but eventually withdrawn and with repatriated. Marge's most recent book, Savage Kin, Indigenous Informants and American Anthropologists, focuses our attention on the vital participation by Native peoples in the work of non-Native anthropologists in the early 20th century era of massive collecting that built the collections of the Peabody, the Hay, and of course, Penn's own museum and the consequences of which we continue to grapple with. I also 
want to recommend to you the blog Marge has maintained along with her students on the wampum trail. In all of these projects, Marge asks us to look again and again and once again at the objects in our collections and our cultures and at the documents that accompanied them. I want to just quote a few of Marge's own words. I hope that's okay, Marge, that describe her approach. She writes, my research in museum representation and repatriation follows an approach that I call restorative methodology which entails close examinations of the people, institutions, theories, and projects responsible for creating and interpreting museum collections. By tracking the interests and social relations of individual collectors and charting the routines of handling that has distributed indigenous materials and records into different museums and archives, I can recover crucial clues to identity and patrimony. This research practice directly engages with issues of indigenous materiality, identity, knowledge, and survivors. Marge's students, I should say, are also doing extraordinary work. For example, some of you know Louise Puyo, who began her project, Lise Puyo, I should say, who began her project on a wampum belt at the Cathedral of Chartres in Roger Chartier's seminar here several years ago. Marge's work and that of her students really compels us to look more closely at all of the environments around us from the cathedral at Schalk to the commemorative markers of downtown Philadelphia. So the wampum belt that Marge will be discussing tonight is on display in the Native American Voices exhibition at the Penn Museum. And we want to acknowledge and thank our colleagues there. Um, what I've selected for display here tonight might be characterized as wampum visualized and textualized in early American colonial writings. There are several major early French accounts 18th century treaties printed by Benjamin Franklin, which described the use of wampum in diplomacy uh, and a couple of other pieces. Um, we hope that complements Marge's work and we're gonna turn it over now to Marge, whose talk tonight is entitled, Reading the Material and Textual Histories in a Path Wampum Belt. Thanks and welcome Marge. Akwai, greetings. Thank you for having me here. So before I start, actually, I'd like to acknowledge that we are on Lenapehoking, traditional Lenni Lenape, also known as Delaware homelands. And much of my work is done in the homelands of Haudenosaunee and Algonquian Indian peoples. And I am deeply grateful to the communities and individuals who work with me on this particular research project. So today, what I have to share with you is a number of approaches to wampum, and I'd like to start by giving you a brief overview of what wampum is. But before I get too far ahead, I'd like you to start thinking about how, let's see, we are not advancing. Can you give me a hand? Yeah, hold on one second, technological details. So usually I just go forward, but it's not responding. Okay. Um, so do I need to use a little arrow? Okay, I can manage that. Thank you. Much appreciated. How do indigenous objects in museum collections speak to those who collect, curate, observe, and claim them? These objects obviously reflect particular ecosystems, eras, cultures, and technologies, but I ask, do they also retain memories of the artisans who created them, of the communities they came from, of the people who handled them, and the messages they were intended to carry? When we retrace the origins of seemingly mysterious objects in the museum, can those memories be awakened? My primary focus today is on this 18th century path belt, Penn Museum number NA9143. In museum context, native objects are often considered to be both animate and silent, inanimate and silent, having been physically and conceptually detached from the relations of texts that gave them meaning. Archivists and curators have long trained us to use selective filters to sort objects into classifications, to see what is expected, to recognize a familiar form, to know what fits the system and know what is unknowable. And wampum belts are often presented as inherently unknowable. This is in the absence of consultation with indigenous knowledge bearers. So perhaps it should be no mystery that indigenous meanings are lost or distorted. So I work to untangle that. 
Now, museological sorting practices separated people from objects, objects from communities, and communities from their stories. Wampum belts that have once spoken very clearly were rendered into mute objects of fascination, reflecting the influence of collectors more than communities. But if we look closer, if we consider the material details and construction of these object beings, we can better understand how they reflect the intentions that brought them into being. And in some cases, even seemingly unknown histories can be re recovered by tracking related correspondence and archives. So today I offer some reflections on the curatorial histories of objects that despite decades of silence are waking up. Wampum belts wield not just imagined meaning or distributed agency, but literal power as conveyors of messages, participants in diplomacy, and other than human beings. Their meanings can be best understood and recovered by considering indigenous conceptions and by consulting with indigenous wampum keepers. But before we delve too far into the path of the wampum belt, let me introduce you to some basic understandings of wampum materiality and messaging. The generic term wampum derives from the Algonquian word wampum pig for white shell beads. It refers to white and purple cylindrical shell beads carved from marine whelk, either Bizicon caniculatum or Bizicon carica, and quahog, mercenaria mercenaria, harvested from the coastal waters along present day Long Island Sound, and also to a certain degree along the St. Lawrence. Now the individual beads retain visible traces of their origins in these liminal environments of fresh and salt water where rivers meet oceans. The white beads are best taken when the shells are young. They have a natural pearl-like sheen having been carved from the inner walls of the whelk. The purple beads best taken when these shell beings are decades old are carved from the outer edges of Kalog. They have a deep purple sheen. The oldest beads are so dark as to be almost black. Now the dramatic difference in color density between these two beads enables them to effectively participate in a binary signaling system. Now in general, and this is a broad generalization, white signals ease, harmony, peace, alliance, agreement. Purple signals complexity, difficulty, and potential danger, but it can also signal a concentration of power or resources. Now these beads were woven together with plant fibers and leather strands to encode and communicate tribal relations and diplomatic understandings. Now these assemblages arranged in symbolic or figurative patterns have long been utilized by North American indigenous people, particularly Haudenosaunee and Algonquian in adornment, political communications and cultural records. Now the messages woven into wampum belts are most obviously and clearly seen when they are employed as acts of cultural performance, draped across the shoulders of a tribal dignitary, held up during a council meeting, or otherwise ceremoniously displayed with words spoken over them. Wampum belts can also be rejected by being thrown to the ground or stepped upon and walked away from. So in council meetings, they are treated as animate speaking beings that can also be rejected and silenced if need be. And I should note that this particular wampum belt is a Huron wampum belt that you'll notice has an ax on it. And when you look closely at the details, in among the ax are little bits of red ochre. And this is because when you create a message of war or a message of violence, red is often added to the white beads in a wampum belt, usually a mixture of blood and red ochre, which is another story. Now, native artisans knew exactly when and how to harvest these marine beings, which plant materials to find to weave into fibers for weft strands, and how to process animal hides to create the leather strands for warp. They utilized a square weave pattern that includes distinctive crosses and twists to secure the weft to the edges of the belt. Slight alterations in these techniques can reflect regional traditions that bespeak particular artisans. All of these knowledges and relations between ocean and land, forest and shore, flora and fauna, dark and light beads, one or another weaving pattern, and loose and assembled components, these all come into play in the making of wampum. Specific patterns and symbols carried specific messages, often operating in concert with oral traditions and during the colonial era written documents. And I should note that the image here shows my dear colleague, Rick Hill, who is a Tuscarora traditionalist and wampum expert, 
with Stephanie Mock, who is here at the Penn Museum, is one of my assistants. And they are at the recital of the Great Law at Akhwasasne in 2015. And one of the interesting traditions that emerged in the 20th century was the making of wampum belts out of glass beads, plastic beads, clay beads, even beads clipped from insulation wire. And this is in part because the traditional wampum belts were mostly stolen and taken to museums so that during the early 20th century, it was very difficult to continue these ceremonial practices. And as an intervention, many Native people started making alternative wampum belts. To a certain degree, these were sometimes classified as fake wampum or imitation wampum. But these, when they are used in ceremony, as in the recitation of the Great Law shown here, take on the same purpose and power as the original belts. And this was a case where the new belts were used while the old belts were displayed so they could also be witness to the goings on. Now to give you a sense of how to read wampum and how it's constructed with messages embedded into it, let me show you this particular object known as the dish belt, which lived in the Royal Ontario Museum until about seven years ago. It reflects the dish with one spoon concept where allies would literally or conceptually be fed together, usually beaver tail stew, evoked by a purple dish situated within a large territory of white beads. The ontology of this object, the knowledge held in the belt itself, embodies the ideal of reciprocal relations among humans and other than humans within a shared ecosystem. So the notion is that the white represents the territory where all is available, all is at ease. The purple is a concentration, not danger in this case, but a concentration of resources. It forms the dish and in the midst of the dish, is the food that will be eaten. And the food conceptually is white, meaning that it will sustain you, it will rejuvenate you as you consume it. Now the ontology of this object embodies the idea of reciprocal relations, but the political message is a little more interesting. It is that they will have one dish and what belongs to one will belong to all. To all. So the political message implies shared stewardship and ownership of the ter territory. Now in the museum, this belt was mute, but when it was restored, the intentions reawakened and they are now being widely communicated and discussed among Algonquian and Haudenosaunee communities in Ontario in particular, where the belt was made to live. Now, another interesting example is a document that survives at the American Philosophical Society. And this is a very rare case where the document includes little sketches of the wampum belts that are being described. It's a list of 34 wampum belts that were carried by a Lenape delegation to Onondaga in 1712. <clears throat> and along the way, each belt had a particular purpose. And the zigzag belt, which you see illustrated here, was meant to say this, here's the quote, that when they arrive, they would fully hear and understand them and that they may have liberty to pass and repass in all places. In other words, it represents a journey that may go in multiple locations, but you can safely go back and forth. So when you are carrying this belt, it is rather like a passport. It enables you to travel that distance. Now, one might say, well, where is the actual belt? And I would say, well, perhaps it's in the British Museum. Because as it happens, there is a single zigzag belt that ends in a truncated end, as you see here. And where it goes, I don't know if it's obvious, but it goes from three rows down to two rows and diminishes down to two beads at the very bottom. And in that way, it matches this particular sketch, whether it is intended to be this belt or not is an open question. But the construction of the belt that lives at the British Museum is such that it does indeed match other known Lenape belts, such as the one that lives here in Philadelphia, the two that live in DC at the National Museum of the American Indian. And the details, the weaving pattern, the bead selection, the arrangement of beads have a strong relationship to other known Lenape belts. So it could well be this is the one depicted. It's hard to say at this juncture because the British Museum has literally no information other than the value of it when it was purchased and who the dealer was. And that is surprisingly common, but not insurmountable. So these and other questions inspired the creation of the project on the Wampum Trail. While the project began as a provenance survey, I naively thought I could match up every belt with a document and a location in a community. 
But the project quickly evolved through consultation with indigenous artisans and wampum experts and through learning from those absent artisans in the past, it evolved into a material survey recording traces of construction, reconstruction, repair, and repurposing. Because I came to realize that former scholars had not actually looked at the details. Even when belts were x-rayed, people had not enumerated the number of glass beads, the number of repurposed beads, the beads that were painted or colored in some way, the beads that were replaced, or even moments of repair. And there was often an assumption that repairs were curatorial. But when I started really digging into these objects, I found many of the repairs were indigenous and they can be traced to locations before the belts came to the museum. Perhaps the best example of that is that one of the belts at Chartres Cathedral, which came from the Huron community, includes the same kind of glass beads that were used in rosary beads. And when I first saw this belt in person, I was told that those were curatorial repairs by the Jesuits or by the nuns. But in fact, when Lees looked at the belt very, very closely and took photographs, it's clear that they are in the original weave. And not only that, but the glass beads are only in the Latin letters that evoke Christian saints. They are not in the white background that depicts Huron territory or in the word Huronia. So it's very clever where these beads appear. But now that's another story. So part two is explaining what I describe as restorative research methods. So you have a sense of how I go about this work. Now to recover these fragmented histories, I deploy what I call restorative methodologies. And this is just a short list. There are many ways to approach this, but I specifically am focused on not just object analysis and archival research, which are rather obvious, but charting where objects have traveled, also charting where ideas have traveled and specifically critical scholarship, because I have found, especially in academia, that there is a tendency to rely upon the words of the elders or the knowledge keepers who came before us. So when it comes to wampum ceremonialism, people like William Fenton were regarded as knowledge keepers, even though he is not Haudenosaunee and he was deeply opposed to the notion of, con of continuity in Haudenosaunee ceremonialism. So I apply a very critical eye to what has been said before and really track it to its source. So just a few examples. Many times I come into museums and I am told what the museological knowledge is about an object. And I was told quite authoritatively that this beautiful little wampum piece here was Apache in origin. Even though the Apache never used wampum, there's no evidence they ever traded in it or engaged in it. And moreover, I was told it was made by Apache prisoners in the late 1800s. And no aspect of that museum tradition holds true. It is in fact a Northeastern Wabanaki, either Penobscot or Passamaquoddy wampum collar, not even a belt, but a collar. And I should say, by the way, those words collar and belt might lead you to imagine that these are garments, but they are not. It is simply an easy term for what they look like. So sometimes a collar is intended to be worn but a wampum belt is only worn if it is displayed ceremoniously. It is not a literal tie around the waist piece of clothing. Now, in going into archives, it helps enormously to be multilingual. Lise has been an incredible research assistant, especially in the French archives. And I have found that in many cases, and you may even find this here at Penn in, in different locations, one piece of documentation will be in the archive the material object will be somewhere else. The received knowledge will be somewhere else altogether. And the experts will be in some other institution. And these sources don't talk to each other. So a lot of what I do with the Wampum Trail Project is physically traveling to these different locations, engaging with these communities, meeting with curators, asking people what they think more than what they know or how they know what they know. So for example, uh, the article that you can see, and it is an open source article that I did for APS called Broken Chains of Custody. But there are two wampum belts I discussed in that article, and they are closely related to these two that still live at the Canadian Museum of History. And all four of them were at Ganesatage, which was a mixed community of Mohawk and Algonquin and Nipissing people in the late 1700s, early 1800s. And these belts, have not yet been returned because we are still trying to pin down, do they relate to the Algonquin community or the Mohawk community or the Nipissing community? And so rather than rush to repatriate, it's a case where I've asked the museum to wait until we can get a little more information. 
whereas the two that were returned were unmistakably Kinastage Mohawk. So critical scholarship also leads to some really interesting discoveries. What Lees is looking at here in collections is a, a, um, a diamond wampum belt that has 24 diamonds, but it is woven in the precise pattern and structure and approach to match the wampum belt that is here that is a 14 diamond wampum belt. And so far, that is virtually all we know about those two belts. I know a little more about the 14 one that I can talk about later, but we know that they show signs of the same kinds of bead selection, the same weaving patterns, the same approach to weaving, the same number of rows, but different lengths. What does that mean? I can't tell you right now for certain, but there is a relationship. And so I am also tracking everything where there are possible relationships, keeping those records in the instance that something does occur that fills in the blanks. So material insights have led to some really interesting discoveries. So when we ask what materials make up these, these objects that we call wampum belts, I found that in many cases, sources will say that all the beads were from cohog, which is simply not true. People do use cohog to make both white and dark beads today, but you don't get the same kind of extremes of color. And then distinctive flora, fauna, and ecosystems, there are many different weaving materials, including milkweed that can work. And the skills and knowledges in these belts are really quite discernible. But again, because they were classified as primitive objects, that wasn't something that anyone truly focused on. And I could go on with quite a lot of detail, but I'd also like to share with you a few textual insights. Because in some cases, there are documents that may record an object's construction or may help contextualize it. But I am most interested in these questions in the center of this list. Who has handled this object? What do they believe about it? Who collected it? How do they represent it? How do they value it? Are there any comparable objects in other museums? And what have scholars said? And I often find when I get to the bottom of this list that usually indigenous authorities have not been consulted other than perhaps to engage in a contentious argument about repatriation. So now what you've been patiently waiting for, the case history. So this particular wampum belt is one of two that live in the Penn Museum. And again, the object at the top is a collar, not a belt. We're not discussing it today. Above is the 14 diamond belt, below is the path belt. The 14 diamond belt and the path belt, they both bear obvious signs of having been constructed in the 18th century. And I can say that because of the way in which they're composed, the kinds of bead selections you see in them. When I first saw these objects, I was told that there was no information to be found, that research had, be done, had been done and it came up short. And of course, I love that kind of challenge. I embrace that challenge. So I said, all right, let's just see. And I started by just asking the obvious questions. How are they constructed? What do we know about them? Where did they originate? And what I found pretty early on is that the records of how they got to the museum were really very clear, who they were purchased from, how much they were, were cost, how much they cost, how they were valued. And that was kind of it no one had really gone further. And yet path belts are so, so evocative. It's a, it's a message that is really so clear. I'm very surprised that no one wanted to know more. So in this case, it's eight rows wide, 31 inches long, purchased from Walter C. Wyman for $500 in 1920. Wyman acquired a number of wampum belts. They sold to multiple museums. I'm in the process of tracking all of them. But the very first thing that I did was to call in a few people that I trust and rely on. Pete Jemison, who we saw early on, is a Seneca faith keeper and member of the Haudenosaunee Standing Committee. Uh, Lisa Brooks, who is Abenaki. Doug George Canentio, who is Mohawk. And just the process of starting to talk around and about and with these belts started to wake something up. And so the first question was, what, what is the sense of being with these belts? What can we get from them? We know that they were used. We know they both show signs of having been handled. They also show signs of having been damaged but not repaired. There are a few missing beads here and there. But none of those details are accessible through the museum. Even after I did the initial research, the museum has yet to 
load up that information. So for instance, it's listed as a gift of Walter Wyman. Well, that's an expensive gift if you're paying $500 to receive a gift, unless it's a reciprocal exchange, who knows? But so that's pretty much all you'll find. And then when you look at it on exhibit, you won't find much more. So the exhibit tells you that it is vaguely hoded Shoni. But when I first started diving into the archives, I very quickly found that there's dense documentation in the director's correspondence. I found that the belt was once in the possession of Reverend Elkanah Holmes, who left it to Roswell Graves, who left it to his son, Roswell Graves Ryerson. Ryerson sold the belt to an antiquities dealer, Wyman, who then sold it to the Penn Museum. But of course, none of that is in the finding aid or on display. And although it's only vaguely identified as Iroquois, the design and intentions woven into it were, as it happens, meticulously well-documented in 18th century missionary reports that described its use by indigenous tribal leaders. Now, before I walk you into the reports, I'd like to just share with you a little insight into how I do research. Once I learned that Elkanah Holmes had his hands on this, I started by tracking him on Ancestry.com to see who he was related to and where he lived and where he traveled. I then started tracking his writings, which were scattered through various missionary journals. And then I locked myself into an archive over the course of a weekend and went through every issue of missionary journals I could find in person and digital from 1790 to about 1810 because I knew when Holmes was working and I also knew that he was missionizing among the Seneca and Tuscarora and others. And that's what led me to this document, which is really golden in terms of wampum research. So this particular belt is very precisely described in a November 23rd, 1797 letter from the Stockbridge Mohican to Elkanah Holmes. It's in response to a letter he sent to them, one of several indicating that he was coming to do missionary work among them. When they gave him the belt, they said it would enable his peaceful travels among the Six Nations Haudenosaunee in the US and Canada amid the tensions leading up to the War of 1812. Not a very safe time to be traveling. The wampum belts constructed for purposes like these were not considered to be dead tokens of diplomacy or gifts, but they were active partners in diplomacy. They were meant to record and facilitate intertribal and international relations in ways that continue to resonate into the present. So let me give you a little more detail to explain. I love this section because it precisely records the language of wampum diplomacy. In wampum diplomacy, and especially in the edge of the wood ceremony, the belief is that nothing can be accomplished unless our minds are at ease, unless our eyes are looking clearly, unless our ears are open, and our throats are clear. Because if we do not bring our whole selves to diplomacy, we can accomplish nothing. But before we even get there, we have to have a clear path to travel. And so this belt visually and conceptually creates that path. So it notes, brothers, they are speaking to Holmes in plural because they are speaking to him as an agent of the American Baptist Society. Brothers, to maintain the covenant of friendship, we now, according to the custom of our forefathers, open the common path one step wider. For we know you cannot walk so well on a narrow path, for you are apt to take four legs besides yours. In other words, you are traveling on horseback, so you need a wider road. Mm -hmm. But this is interesting in itself because wampum is not originally Mohican diplomacy in this particular form. So this follows the letter and the form of Haudenosaunee wampum diplomacy. We remove every green and rotten logs from this path and pull every briar and thorn and remove every rough stone so you can see our fireplace clearly. So when you walk, you can see us. Even if we are not visible, you know we are there. Brothers, you have a council fire to the one end and we have ours this end. And that is what you see at either end of the belt. Those are two council fires. Let us therefore always keep the path clear. And then it ends by saying on this path, we can both walk forwards and backwards and let it be known to all that it may never be forgotten a belt of wampum delivered. Now, if any of you spend any time reading through documents that list wampum, you will read a single document and perhaps 30 belts will be delivered. And you'll be asking yourself, where did those go? What did they look like? In the course of diplomacy, often belts were repurposed. They were shown and then they were taken back. 
and they were used and then they were given away. Or sometimes they were shown and given and then taken apart to weave into other belts. There are actually documents that record at a council meeting, you can see women who are the last recipients of the belt being given and they are taking it apart to compose another belt so it will be ready in time for the next phase of wampum giving. So sometimes it was that quick of a turnaround. But oftentimes belts were what I call one-offs or unique agents that were meant to serve a particular purpose. And that was the case with this path belt. It was meant to always show a path among the Haudenosaunee. And I'll say a little more about that in a moment. So Stockbridge Mohican Captain Hendrik Offama was one of the signatories on this particular letter. And he was especially engaged in diplomatic relations with the Haudenosaunee and with colonial leaders in the aftermath of the American Revolution. And part of the logic of this is that the Stockbridge Mohican formed a regiment that fought with the American rebels, but they lost the town of Stockbridge as a result. They came back from war to find that English overseers had taken most of the land. And so they left to relocate and to live among the Oneida in a town they called New Stockbridge, close by Brother Town, which was also a new town of Christian Indians. So this is in the 1780s and 90s. And so at that particular time period, the Mohican are already living with the Haudenosaunee and already needing to travel freely among them. So I would suggest that this was actually a belt that the Oneida gave the Mohican, and then they gave it to Holmes. Now, I mentioned description, pretty darn clear. This is in the same document. We're given to understand that the belt mentioned above is more than two feet in length. Yeah, 31 inches is more than two feet. Three inches in breadth, exactly. Eight rows of pure wampum, yes. Two of which are purple, signifying a plain wide path. The other six rows denoting the six nations of Indians, because at this point in time, what was once the five nations confederacy was now the six nations. Oneida, Onondaga, Cayuga, Seneca, Mohawk, and Tuscarora. Three rows on each side implying safety and liberty to path. At the end of the belt or path is a square formed of purple and white. One end is the Mohicanuck Nation and the other end is the New York Baptist Association. But wait a minute, that doesn't quite work because Stockbridge is in Western Massachusetts and the Stockbridge had moved to Oneida and the travel between, so you see Tuscarora, Oneida, Mohawk, Center, Dracos, Onondaga, is across New York State. But when you head down to the Baptist Society in New York City, that doesn't make sense. That really doesn't parse. So again, that's part of my logic thinking this was a Haudenosaunee belt that the Mohicans decided to repurpose for their own goals. But moving on. As the belt traveled in the hands of Reverend Elkanah Holmes, I tracked through his various sermons and information about the founding of the mission at Buffalo Creek and elsewhere. And I found that everywhere he went with this belt, there was a reference to it. So for instance, when he visited the Seneca war leader, Red Jacket, Red Jacket responded saying, Father, we're happy you've come. That's not usually the case when you're meeting missionaries. But in this case, they say, we're happy you've come. And uh, we thank you for the pains that our brothers, the Oneida and Mohicanucks have taken in sending this good talk with wampum at the same time holding the talk and wampum in his hand. So at one point I was saying, you know, if we were to try DNA traces on this, we might find traces of Red Jacket's hands. <laughs> we might find traces of all the hands that have touched this belt. But then we'd be at that for a very long time because in wampum diplomacy, everyone touched the belts. So this would have been the scene with Red Jacket speaking and Holmes at his side and the belt would be handled and seen by everyone. So really these were moving objects among and through multiple communities. Now, in terms of moving, the movement the belt went through when it left Holmes's hands is part of what altered its meaning so dramatically. <clears throat> So it went from Tuscarora territory to Brantford with Holmes. I still don't know exactly how it came into the hands of the people who held it after that. But once it was leaving Holmes and sold to a collector and it came to Philadelphia, all coherence was lost, as unfortunately was true of many objects that came to these large museums. And so for quite a long time, this belt was silent in collections. And there's no evidence that Roswell Graves, who had held it after Holmes, had any relationship whatsoever 
with Haudenosaunee or Mohegan tribal leaders. And when the belt was sold, it was depicted as an isolated relic and the Penn Museum made no effort to identify it and in, in effect erased patrimonial memories by accepting it as a valuable commodity, as an isolated relic. Now, at one time, this belt was awakened in a very odd way when my former colleague, Bob Purcell, decided to adopt it as a model for the logo of the Penn Center for Native American Studies. At that point in time, he depicted it as a generic friendship belt, which it is not. And he sort of missed the point that it's a path belt marking way through troubled times. The dark path and dark boundaries signal complexity and conflict. And when he went to transform the belt into a logo, which you see here, uh, he thought, wouldn't it be lovely to add a purplish blue and a red to match Penn's colors? But in wampum semiotics, the color red signals war. So in effect, by darkening the white areas that were meant to be safe locations at either end of this belt, the message is now, go here and die. Not a good message. So a more culturally accurate and peaceful level of creativity emerged in another instance when Tuscarora traditionalist Rick Hill mimicked the pattern of that belt by making a new belt composed entirely of glass beads to record the knowledge sharing collaboration between the American Philosophical Society in Philadelphia and the Dale Hage Indigenous Knowledge Center in Ontario, Canada. And now, in closing, feels like we're moving rapidly through this, but leaving plenty of time for questions and conversation. Let me make this point clear. Wampum belts were not designed to live in museums. They were brought into corporeal form to function as agents and encounters, speakers in diplomatic settings, partners in alliance, and memories made material. When wampum belts were acquired by non-native collectors, these messages were silenced, if not lost. But memories and knowledges can be reawakened if objects are restored to their cultural context. As a case in point, these are the two wampum belts that were originally constructed at Onondaga in the early 1700s and sent to the Gnesetake Mohawk on the St. Lawrence to remind them that they were still part of the Confederacy, even though they were Catholic. The belts left Gnesetake in 1915 when they were stolen out the back door of the church and sold to a Frenchman who sold them to Frank Speck. Speck sold two of them to the Canadian Museum, where they still live today, and kept these two until selling them about 30 years later to the Museum of the American Indian, in part because Native people were searching for them. And so in this particular case, they traveled through the hands of multiple collectors and museums, including a detour to Sotheby's auction house, acquiring new meanings as relics and art objects until they were finally recombined. And when I staged this photograph here, you'll note that I tried to match Speck's original photograph. So this is my photo in 2018 and that Speck's photo in 1915. But this is really the way that they are meant to live. Because when the belts were finally repatriated after extensive research and delicate diplomacy with private collectors and museums and found their way home, they were reanimated. And you can see the difference in how these objects come alive in the hands of traditional leaders who know how to hold them and carry them and what to do and what to say with them. So in closing, this is my point. The process of recovering meaning requires not just research rigor and ethical attention, but consultation, collaboration, and kinship. It also requires a considerable amount of humility about what we do and do not know. Restorative approaches could bring tribal nations and museums closer to reconciliation. The steps can include, but are by no means limited to the approaches I outline here. For just as the Haudenosaunee have long utilized rituals of condolence to guide grieving or conflicted parties out of conflict and toward clear-mindedness, we can introduce collaborative models of research and repatriation to improve our understandings of object histories and to repair museum relations with the indigenous. And what you see here is this wonderful photo of my dear friends, Alan Corbier, who is Anishinaabe, and Rick Hill, who is Tuscarora, holding the 1815 Pledge of the Crown Wampum Belt, which had been sold to several collectors, sold to George Gust of High, stored here at the Penn Museum, and went missing in the drawers for a number of years until it was finally relocated. And it's since been repatriated 
and now the Haudenosaunee and Algonquin people bring it out together to record that old alliance. But the gist of it is this, no matter what these objects have been through, they are still connected to Indigenous histories. They may appear as strangers to you, but they are somebody's kin. Even if you think they are dead, they may yet be alive. Thank you. So what I want to close with um, a couple of things. First of all, I just want to give yet another shout out to my lovely assistants, Lise Puyo and Stephanie Mott, and to Rick Hill, who really is the person who put me on this trail because Rick realized with the Sotheby's auction in particular that there were so many cases where wampum was not accessible to the communities that were trying to reclaim it. And so when he said things like, you know, I need you to get into the Vatican, I need you to get into these different archives, I said, you know, we'll do what we can do. And then this last year was especially inspiring because these are three Wampanoag artisans, Julia Martin, Paula Peters, and Linda Coombs. And they have been searching for decades for wampum belts that were taken from the Wampanoag at the end of King Philip's War in the 1670s and sent to England and disappeared. And so we still have not found the missing Wampanoag wampum, but the British Museum, Pitt Rivers Museum and Arts Council England supplied funding to create a new wampum belt. And so this is the beginning of a new Wampanoag wampum belt that was a rejuvenation of wampum technology to the point where not only did they design the belt, but they brought it around to Aquina and Mashpee communities over the course of a year so people could work on weaving it. And when it was completed, it was sent to England to be put on display and it's coming home shortly and it will be displayed in the Northeast. But so in this case, they created a new wampum belt using old technology, using shell beads. These are not glass beads, including sending people out into Long Island Sound waters to harvest the shells and prepare them. And it was made with long dangling strands to indicate that the story continues. Mm -hmm. And so that's really, I think, a lovely image to end on, that wampum ceremonialism is not dead, is very much alive, is being rejuvenated in these multiple forms, and the story continues. So there you go. Thank you.